I'm Drew Hutcherson. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from the studios of Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street in Greenfield. But we're not just seen in Greenfield. I, meant that I Drew Hutcherson, <laughs> am the director of Hadley Media. And as such, Local Bias now is more of a regional show. So, you know, we'll define local. Well, we certainly go to Hadley and beyond. And so I'm not going to necessarily be talking to as many town councilors about issues that are germane only to Greenfield. I'm interested in, in more universal concepts. And to that end, I've invited on Marion Kellner to join me today. And also, Marion has agreed to host quite a few shows. Yes. Um, because I've I'm such a fan of yours. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, you had a show on WMCB, 107.9 LPFM Greenfield, called Speciocracy, where all beings, beings have, have a, a voice. voice. Yes. And you don't do that show anymore. No. But I used to sit out in the car and listen to you. I'd be one of those things that's on the radio as I'm driving. <laughs> I would stop to go somewhere, and I'd have to sit there and just listen to you. <laughs> Thank because, you. Because well, it was just... It was so fascinating, and, and in fact, I've read a couple of your books, uh, um, May We Be Like the Penguins, and As a Sailboat, Sailboat Seeks the Wind, and yes. don't try to say that three times fast. <laughs> um, I haven't read this one, yes, Expect the, the Unexpected, one. but um, they had the same gentle wisdom and humor and perspective, which is um, not typical. Somehow, you look at the world a little bit differently than anybody else I know. <laughs> so. Let me ask you, <laughs> what were you like as a child? Well, I would say that I was on the fringes of society then. Every aspect of my life, even as a child, was sort of outside the mainstream. Okay. So I grew up in a family that was very left-wing, growing up in a conservative town. Okay, and where was that? Nutley, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, I was very athletic, a tomboy when girls didn't have athletic opportunities. Uh, I was Jewish in a Catholic town. Uh, even within my family, I, I never quite fit in. So it has its drawbacks <laughs> where there's not a sense of belonging. Okay. Uh, but it has its advantages in that being on the outside looking in, it's almost like an anthropologist mm -hmm. or something like that. Right, you're detached. Yeah, you're, you're not enmeshed in the same water everybody's swimming in. Right. So to some degree, I think it gave me a perspective um, that's a little bit different from other people. And then, I don't know, I was just sort of uh, born that way. And, but you've been in Greenfield for a number of years now. Do you feel you belong here? Yes. I would say this town has been really, really good to me. I've had a, so anything you want to do, you can do here. Right. So for writing, there are so many, and this is region-wide as well, there are so many writing groups. Mm -hmm. There's so much music, spiritual stuff, any avenue you want to go down political opportunities. I mean, I don't think I would have been on the town council in any other town, but right. it was, everything is just, um, people are super friendly also. When I have people visit me from out of town or out of this region, that's one of the main things they remark about is how friendly people mm -hmm. are here and open and sort of um, in general, uh, open, accepting. Um, my sister lives in a small town out west and she just sees the comparison of mm -hmm. lack of uh, vindictiveness here, right. generally speaking. So, uh, yeah, I feel at home at home here. And yet there are certainly are, uh, there is a lot of political fighting that goes on. I'm friends on Facebook, for instance, with people on the left and people on the right and they're friends with each other as well on Facebook. And so um, somebody may say something on Facebook and then all of a sudden it's just like, he said, she said, he said, she's, well, what about, and it's just back and forth. And it's like, really? <laughs> so, I mean, there's a certain amount of antipathy towards each other's perspectives at times. Yes. And yet by the same token, I sat down with 
one of the prominent Republican leaders in Greenfield, um, it was a few months ago, but we sat down and had breakfast, and we talked, and we really agreed on 95% of everything, because we, we all want to have a, a healthy community, we all want our children to get a good education, we really do want to have a clean environment, I mean, mm -hmm. that's something that people really do agree on, it, it's just that our perspective over you know, priorities, um, it seems that people that are more conservative often have a higher fear index or a disgust index. That is, they have a fear of um, that we're going to be invaded by Islamic terrorists, for instance, or um, they're a fear that people are going to take all their money because they're going to get regulated to death and they're mm -hmm. not going to be able to have a business. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's, um, but but ultimately, we just want to be happy and healthy and secure in our homes and, and feel that we're contributing to the community. And, yeah. and uh, these are lovely people, just wired a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And yet, on a national stage, it seems like it's, it's vicious. And um, you know, I listen to a, some sports radio, and there's a, a show on in the morning where you know, liberals are libtards. And they're pretty evil, and, they're, and the liberals are trying to destroy America because they hate this country. And I'm just listening to this, going, "How can anybody say that? And do they believe that what they're saying?" Yeah. Well, I think eventually people can believe anything they're saying. Well, they they do tend to <laughs> believe. In fact, I think that everyone rationalization, right. you know, the defense mechanism of rationalization, where you give yourself a reason that sounds really good for something that is not true, right. or very likely is not true, is one of the main ways that people go through life. You can, it's very dangerous. You can rationalize anything. You know, I've seen myself do it if I don't want to face the truth, you know, if my self-esteem is going to be undermined, or I don't want to face I did something wrong, or I could see the excuse, you know, mm -hmm. it's because of this and this and this. And then if you bring it up to a national level or an international level, that's the only way war can begin. Right. People have their rationalizations. And that hate talk, those are all rationalizations. That I think you say it enough to yourself, you believe it, and you tell other people enough, they believe it, but it doesn't have a basis in truth. Right. But, but one nice thing about Greenfield is that because it's such a small town, we actually know each other. And so that kind of wipes the veneer away from, from those words. Um, because if you've, if you've lived in an area and you've never actually encountered somebody that was other, it's very easy to see the other as lesser or dangerous. And I was listening to, I think it was TED Talks the other day, and it was a, because it was Veterans Day, and this fellow was talking about how they had to go out and, you know, there were the dead bodies and they, they were checking the effects of the Viet Cong dead bodies and they always found diaries with letters and pictures of loved ones. And he says, oh my God, these people are just like us. And yet, that's, you know, they're taught that this is Charlie and they're, they're trying to impose communism on us. And, and I mean, we're being taught that they're subhuman and, that they're, and they're, they're communists. Right. And as soon as you put a label on someone, they're objectified. That's right. And what you're talking about, that underneath it, whatever the human constructs are, you know, political affiliation, religious affiliation, gender affiliate, any of those things, they're all human constructions. Right. If you go underneath it, we're like living beings on this planet in the middle of an infinite universe, <laughs> spinning who knows where, and we have the same needs, you know, to, to survive, to have food, to have connections with people, and connections with the environment and the other beings that live here. Right. And this culture has really, for the most part, at least officially, severed those ties to the natural world. Right. And for me, that's one of the major reasons for people's sense of alienation, lack of connection, not only to the natural world, but once you're cut off from that life force, then you're cut off from people as well. Mm -hmm. There's no real separation. So, you know, the event that they had over in Leverett, a few, I, this is, I guess, in October, where they had people who voted for Trump come up from oh, right. Kentucky. Right. 
And, you know, the interest in these people were, was huge. It was standing room only. Um, but people, as soon as people start talking to each other, whether it's Israelis and Palestinians, uh, Trump people and Bernie people, whatever, it's as you said, we all have the same desires to love, be loved, respect, the whole, the whole thing. But I, I, want, I always take it a step further that this is true of animals as well. That's right, and all life. All life. And it's only human beings expanding their consciousness slowly, slowly, slowly to realize trees communicate with each other. That's right. They look out for each other. They send out Even warning. different species yeah. communicate with each other. Right, animals do. I mean, one of the most amazing things I ever saw was on my back walk after a rain and there were slugs there. And one slug had been squashed by accident, it was dead. I watched, you know, and this is also part of slowing down in time, we're always in a rush, we don't see anything. Right. But I had the time to just sit there and there were two slugs that came up to the dead slug. Very similar to the way elephants come up to a dead elephant and we're walking around and going over the body and then stay, one of them stayed with the body over time. Most people don't attribute this kind of relational capacity mm -hmm. to slugs, certainly, to insects. You know, there are a few choice animals that people say, oh, oh yeah, yeah. dolphins yeah. or pigs. Yeah. Or the cute ones, the magnificent ones, but they're all magnificent right. and amazing and complex. And it's, it's, it's the same thing. They've been defined as other. Right. But they have exactly the same needs we do, food, survival, air, water, connections with each other, families, raising the young, social systems. It's exactly the same. And we, see, and we think we're apart from all that, or we're above all that, like we have dominion over it. Mm -hmm. And of course it goes back to if, if we truly have dominion, let's say, you know, look, taking the biblical look at it, well, wouldn't that mean we have a responsibility to actually husband it for future generations? Not and I think the it. original word, you know, as people go back, it was more the sense of stewardship. Right. Not control, not domination. Right. Not, I mean, of course, we have the power, right? We do have the power. Things have evolved in a certain way so that we can do things that can affect every living thing on the planet. So that has to be acknowledged. But then how do you use power? Right. And this was one of my things, which is why I sort of ended up um, going to what I thought was the basic political platform, animal mm -hmm. rights, environmental stuff. Because my thing has always been that we have to recognize how we ourselves are oppressors. So I could belong to different groups that certainly have been oppressed right. through time and recognize it and try to get justice um, and equality. But at, at the exact same time, I have to watch out for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, who am I taking advantage of? Whether it's somebody I'm eating for lunch, <laughs> you know, some animal, tuna fish, or right. um, recognizing that life is as valid as mine. Right. How, being aware of my connection to that, how am I going to deal with that? How do I oppress myself? I mean, if I'm negative and I'm down on myself and I'm calling myself names and I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. like this, I'm oppressing myself. And if I buy into the political scene of fear mm -hmm. and not being able to relax and just sit back and, and know mm -hmm. I have a right to enjoy life instead of being worried all the time and trying to survive all the time. I'm being an oppressor to myself. Right. So that's where some of the, this talk about political correctness comes in because I think people find it difficult to recognize their own 
oppressiveness toward others. And we all do it. I'm not going to say all the time, but we all do it. Well, we're humans. We're, fa we're fallible. And uh, if you're just tuning, on, tuning in, <laughs> I'm, uh, my guest today is Marion Kel Kellner. And Marion is going to be hosting future episodes of Local Bias. I will st still host some of the episodes. But I found in my experience of having Marion sit in for me in the past is that she's such a wonderful interviewer. <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say, and I want to he hear what your guests have to say. And I get the privilege of doing that if, if you're here doing that. I'm happy to do it. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, in, but we were talking about how we oppress ourselves or how we inadvertently oppress others. It's, the, th the thing is, we can't be perfect. No. So how do you keep moving forward and working on yourself and at the same time giving, cutting yourself some slack when appropriate? And how do you know when it's appropriate? I mean, we're so caught up, we're so subjective. How do we learn to be objective? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you rely on people around you <laughs> to point it out? Hey, Marion, you're being oppressive. <laughs> or do you just do that? Your, how do you get there? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's good if people can gently with love point out things now and then. It's tricky, it's hard. Pema Chodron, the Buddhist teacher, I mean, she frames it as uh, unconditional friendliness with yourself. Okay. So let's say you do something, you're not totally pleased with yourself or you feel bad about it or whatever. Not to jump ship and, and take an outside um, view of it and then sort of critique, critique, critique. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, okay, being honest with yourself, just like you would with a friend. Let's say you see a friend do something and you gently acknowledge it, address it, accept it, decide what you're going to do about it, but not of the self-flagellation that goes on. Right. It's so hard not to, though. I mean, there are, I, I'm a decent person, mm -hmm. but I've, I've said things that are so asinine or done things that were so <laughs> stupid and minor things generally, fortunately, and yet sometimes when my memory bank is kind of replaying stuff, one of these old memories of something really insignificant that's only significant to me comes up and I find I... I get so angry with myself all over again, even if, if it was 15 years ago I did this stupid thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really? I've spent all these years <laughs> learning how to meditate and to love myself and to love everybody, and I still do that self-flagellation. Yeah. It's so hard to get away from that programming. And, mm -hmm. and I don't have the benefit of being raised a Catholic where I have like a guilt thing going on. And I think <laughs> that the Jewish faith probably does the same thing from what I understand. Um, so there's cultural programming and you don't even have to be raised in a, in a belief system, but there's still an overall belief system that's imposed on us. Yes. And the system runs on you're not good enough. Right. The system would collapse if everyone suddenly relaxed and said, I am good enough. I don't need this product and that product and that product. I don't need that person's approval and that one and that one through the products. Right. You know, our economy for the most part, is based on lack of self-confidence, self-doubt, and lack of acceptance. Sure. Well, people, why do people, the most, the majority, I believe, of what people buy or purchase is because they've been programmed to do retail therapy. If they buy something, they're going to feel better about themselves because, aha, look at me, I'm driving a nice car. Aha, look at me, I got this new shiny toy. Now, I know for myself, whenever I buy anything, it's like, why did this have to come in this container? And now I'm throwing this container away, and this container is going to go to a landfill, or it's going to be burned. It's going to, get, it's going to create pollution, all so that I could have this little whatever. There has to be a better way. Is there a better way? Is there some, anything anybody's doing anywhere? Because that one thing alone, I mean, buying less would be great, but being able to buy and not having all this crap attached to it, like all these little things that are strapping it down and plastic that it's bubble wrapped in and I think people are doing that but we don't hear about it okay I remember hearing on the radio and I wish there were more stories like that out because I know it's happening of this company I think two young men invented it and it's you know the the plastic that holds six packs of soda or right. beer yep 
that strangles sea animals and other animals? There's a land mass out in the Pacific Ocean full of those. Well, they've, they created a product out of plant material that serves the same function, but if it goes into the ocean, it's food for the animals that eat it. As opposed to poison. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, choke, you know, or clogging up their digestive system or something, it nourishes them. So, and I think there are tons of inventions like that. So there out are there. solutions. Yeah. What's, what's crazy is it's always about, it seems to be the profit motive. And it's not a fair, you know, it's not a fair playing field. Like somebody may come up with a great solution and then Joe company over here goes, well, if that company does well, that's going to eat into our market share or that's going to change our model. We better buy them up and put them out of business. And that dog eat dog way, you know, behavior in the long run is not sustainable. No. I think it's changing. I mean, when you look at solar energy and how far it's come. Right. Uh, I think if people stick to their, their values and try to make something happen, it's like a new paradigm is, is evolving. And this generation, my generation, and maybe the one after me, you know, we're, we're going to die out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this insistence on fossil fuels in the old ways, I think, will go right. with well, us it's inevitable. to a degree. In some ways. I mean, think about the whaling industry and how big it was. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they struck oil. And then they didn't need whale oil anymore. Mm -hmm. And somehow, that wasn't the end of the world. It was just the end of that particular phase of the world. Right. Right. So I think things are evolving. And I think, you know, you mentioned TED Talks before, that if you go there and you hear these amazing inventions or realizations or expansion of consciousness. Um, there's some young kid in the Netherlands who invented a way to go out to that plastic mass in the Pacific, and he de devised a certain kind of boat and filter system where he thinks within five years he could at least take care of a third of it. Wow. And it's going out there, I think it's supposed to go out this year. But there are all sorts of inventions like that, but we're kept in the mainstream, you know, fearful with this bombardment. You know, these companies spend millions, if not billions, to keep people convinced that they need this product. Right. Uh, if they didn't, it would disappear. Nobody would really care. Right. But these smaller businesses, they don't have the money to do that. The mainstream isn't that interested in letting people know. Because mm -hmm. most of the solutions don't cost that much. Right. Someone created a refrigeration system <laughs> for people who live in the deserts in Africa. And this is all it is. It's a bowl, ceramic bowl. It has sand in it. You wet the sand. You have a bowl sitting within the wet sand. As the water evaporates from the sand, it pulls the heat out from whatever you have on the inside bowl, and it, it keeps the food fresh. That's it. <laughs> I mean, it's... <sighs> but Westinghouse isn't going to make any money selling that. Yeah, but I think that's the wave of the future. It has to be. Well, certainly, and, and, and actually, when we, you know, we know climate change is real. Um, the climate is changing. And I take a look at Puerto Rico and how they, their entire electrical grid was destroyed. And they're up to about 30% now, six weeks after the, or however long it's been. Well, if they had decentralized energy and everyone had solar power. Of which they have Abundant plenty. solar. Yep. It wouldn't be as difficult a problem. No. It wouldn't, and I think that's a big thing that people are struggling with now because the FEMA money goes for recreating what, what was, was there. destroyed. Right. Right. And if that, and that's just a, a human made-up rule. If that were changed, and people say, "Okay, we're going into Puerto Rico, and we're going to set up a vast solar system," 
A hurricane could come, yes, yeah, solar panels could be destroyed, but they could be replaced. It would solve so many, so many problems. Right. So it's the political will, it's people. You know, I heard Elizabeth Warren up in Greenfield, uh, and her whole thing is to inspire each individual to stay with their values, to do what they can do, and that that's, that's the only way things will change. Right. And so I think, I, I sort of have hope. You know, I feel like this whole time is the shadow side right. of human nature, of the culture, has come into the light. And so when you see what's going on on a national level and what's being ex considered acceptable mm -hmm. behavior, right. it's the shadow side. It isn't like it was just created. It's right. always it's been, been there. It's been there. We just, it wasn't maybe brought out and it wasn't considered okay to, to show. Yeah, but it seeped in. Right. Right? It seeped into all, all different subcultures. So in a way, Donald Trump has done us a favor. <laughs> It's, it's part, I guess, of the evolution of human consciousness. It's whether... And it certainly you know. seems like there's, for every two steps forward, there's always a step back. Mm -hmm. I mean, progress is inevitable because change is inevitable. And, of course, sometimes things will cycle back to a way they were. You know, autocratic systems. During times of uncertainty, people are more likely to value the promise of security. Mm -hmm. So they are like, oh, yeah, just keep us safe and, and we don't mind, you know, be a strong leader. We'll give up our liberties to be safe. Even what you're doing is making us less safe. Right. Well, the whole gun thing, it's the idea that more guns will make us safe. And the lack of talking. I mean, it seems even with North Korea over time, they've been saying we want to be respected. Right. We want guarantees. We're not going to be invaded. Right. And so it's this, and I don't know if it's a macho thing. It could be where talking is the last resort. <laughs> but everything comes after you kill a million people, then people talk. Right. It always comes down to talking. Ultimately. Yeah. Why not start with talking? Right. And just like whatever is possible. That's why these groups all over the world that try to bring... Uh, warring factions together just for a conversation right. are so effective, uh, but it's on a small scale. And it takes a long, long time. I mean, take a look at Northern Ireland, and, but eventually they got there. And these are people that for generations, well, you killed my dad, well, you killed my grandfather, well, you killed my great-grandfather. Well, yeah. But it has to stop somewhere, and unfortunately, we have to stop the show. <laughs> <laughs> because we've run out of time. Okay. But I'm so glad that you came on. I'm looking forward to listening to your interviews. I hope the guests at home have been happy to see this <laughs> initial interview. Of, I, don't know, I don't even know what season this is of Local Bias. It's, it might be our 10th season uh -huh. or 11th season. It's mm -hmm. hard to keep track because sometimes I take a year off. But we're back in the saddle. Mm -hmm. Mary Encounter, thank you for joining me. Thank I'm you, Drew Hutchison. Drew. You've been tuned to Local Bias, and we'll be having new episodes coming up every month on GCTV <laughs> and other local cable access stations in your area. Thanks a lot. Take care.